All right, this chapter is on electrostatics. Okay, very basic thing. Like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And you say, well, of course that's true. We've known that since kindergarten. And you probably have, and yes, that's true. What's kind of interesting is no one really knows why. They just do. It's just sort of this fundamental thing in science where the like charges repel, the opposite charges attract, and we go with it. But I think we figured everything out in science, and we haven't. Okay, so everything, you know, basic uh, atom, everything has electrons floating around the edge of it. And inside of the atom, you have these protons. And remember, those are held with a strong nuclear force. They're stuck in there. They're not coming out. They're, they're going to stay there. The electrons on the outside, however, can kind of get knocked off fairly easily. And in fact, as we walk around on a large scale, we shed skin cells, right? Large skin cells. On a very microscopic, tiny scale, electrons tend to come flying off of us too. They will come off your hair in, at the ends of the points there. They come off your hair. But um, electrons can get knocked out. They also will move around quite easily. So they're not really bound super tightly to any atom. Um, and usually, you know, when we look at, at any substance, it's a neutral charge, meaning it's going to have the same number of protons as it is going to have electrons. But those electrons can shift and move around. We can induce charges and we can move these electrons. Okay. So let's look at how we can move electrons. Classically, electrons, um, when you brush your hair with a plastic comb, remember I said your, your hair will have these electrons, you will actually be charging your comb. Um, when you walk across the carpet with your um, socks, or you know, depending on what shoes you're wearing, you can go around shocking people. Well, those are just these free electrons you've rubbed off of other surfaces. So, we, you know, we think of them as locked in there, but they're not. We can rub them off. All right. So there's a thing called an electroscope. You're going to see this slide twice. Um, but the idea is if you put electrons on that top little ball, the two legs of that foil will spread apart. And the reason they spread apart is the electrons will go onto that foil. The electrons are negatively charged. That means each leg of the foil has a negative charge, which means they are like charges and they repel each other. Okay. A Van de Graaff generator will deposit electrons um, onto its surface. The ball, that dome on the top, will have electrons deposited on it. Um, and if you touch it, classically, those electrons will run to the tip of your hair, just like they ran to that tip of the electroscope. Um, they'll try to spread out as far away from each other as possible. And where they like to go are to the tips of things. And so if you have long hair, obviously, you can see in the picture, it looks kind of funny. It'll spread out the hair. Now, the charges are not being destroyed. They're not disappearing. There's no magic involved. We're just pushing them around a little bit. So maybe we take the electrons and... Um, from some fur and we rub it onto a plastic rod. Okay, so the rod is now negatively charged. What's the fur going to be? It's going to be positively charged because we didn't we didn't create magic electrons, right? We just move them from something that was neutral and if you take something that's neutral and you remove these negatives from it, what you're left with is an excess of positives. So it becomes positively charged. All right. So you have insulators and conductors, and you're going to write it on the next slide, so don't write anything here. Um, and, and, and an insulator is going to allow no charge, kind of like an insulator for heat, if you can think of, remember the heat unit, and it didn't allow heat um, to, to flow through it. Well, an insulator for electricity won't allow electricity to flow through it, and a conductor will allow it to flow through it. So in our little diagram here, when you touch um, two charged balls with metal, the charges can flow. Um, with wood, the charges aren't going to flow. Okay. So here now you can actually write that down. Materials such as metals, where the electrons move freely, are called electrical conductors. 
And the way metals work is they're very kind of sharing with their electrons. They don't hold on to them. Um, when you look at the periodic table, they're just kind of jumbled in the middle there. And um, they kind of share these electrons, not, not in the way that you're like, um, uh, not in the way covalent bonds are made, but where they're almost unbonded electrons. They're moving around. Um, other materials, plastic and wood, the electrons don't move as easily, and so they're insulators. It's hard to get a flow through those kind of objects. Um, and then you have things like um, silicon, and they're semiconductors, and what that means is sometimes they will act like a conductor, and sometimes they will act like an insulator. All right, plastic is definitely an insulator, useful on the outside of wires and stuff, so that the charges can't jump off where you don't want them. If you don't have that, then, can, then it can become dangerous. All right, so when you look at something like a Tesla coil, we know that air is normally an insulator, but at very high voltages, it can conduct electricity. Um, and it's actually at, at super high voltages, you can actually break the oxygen apart and you'll smell ozone. You'll make it into this ozone and it'll conduct electricity. But that has to be a pretty high voltage to do that. Okay, Coulomb's law is just like, if you think way, way back to the law of gravity. When we looked at gravity and we said there was a gravitational constant and then you multiplied it from you know, the mass of object one and the mass of object two all over the distance squared. Well, this is just like that formula, only it's going to be for electrical force. You're gonna have a K, a constant. You're gonna have, instead of the mass of object A, you have the charge of object A. And instead of the mass of object B, you have the charge of object B. And you still have it over the distance squared. Um, so very similar to um, the gravitational law that we talked about in the first semester. Okay, so we can induce um, charges and we can force things to separate. We can actually cause charges, it's, it's called an induction. When you take charges on, you know, one object, and you get it close to but not touching another object, you can actually send those electrons away. So if you take a charged object that's negative and you get it close to a neutral can, let's see if I can get this to work. All right, here are your charged objects that are negative. We get it close to this can. This can's neutral and probably before this can showed up, um, you know, there were some positives and negatives just all mixed around in here. But as we put the negatives close to it, we know that what it does is it attracts the positives and it repels these negatives. So this can now has a charge that's induced. It's still technically neutral, but we've, we've lined up all the positives on one side, all the negatives on another side, and now it can attract, um, be attracted to this can. Okay, so you can actually charge things by induction. This is the same idea like what you just saw, only we're gonna discharge some of these electrons at the end here. So you're gonna start with just a jumbled neutral ball. You're gonna have um, chase these electrons to one side, keep the positives on another, and then you allow the little electrons to escape. You give them a pathway, and now this ball stays charged. So that's called charging by induction. We've induced a charge in it, okay? You can do this, remember the electroscope we saw before, you can do this um, without actually touching. The, in the first slide, it was touching. In this slide, you can see it's not actually touching, just get it close enough. You will send those electrons down to the legs and you will have a positively charged ball on the top um, because the positives are attracted to our negatively charged rod, the electrons are repelled by it, they run down to those legs, and the legs will spread apart there. Okay, lightning is also um, starts with charge by induction. A cloud rolls along in the sky, and kind of the friction itself up there as it rolls along causes the charges to separate. So what you end up with 
um, is a cloud where the, the electrons have come down here and you end up with the positive charge at the top and as this moves over the earth it actually induces a charge on the earth where this started very neutral down here but all these negatives here attract the positives and repel the electrons that were here um, and, it, and it induces a charge on the earth as well and actually gives it a pathway for these electrons now to be even more attracted to any point here. The lightning rod, right, think Benjamin Franklin here invented these ideas. Um, one thing is it, if a building is struck, it gives it a path, a ground, so that the, the building actually doesn't catch on fire. You can see that it's attached to a wire here and this will be buried somewhere so that if the lightning strikes here and it tends to strike points if it does strike here it goes um, kinda harmlessly on the outside of the building but the other thing that this also does is it helps discharge some of the the buildup of um, charges before the lightning even strikes just when there's um, a thunderstorm going on, some of this can discharge. I don't know if you can feel if you've ever been in a really good thunderstorm um, with lightning, but like your hairs will stand up on end. Um, and, and that's just charges. That's just charges. And so being able to discharge some of that can actually prevent the building from being struck in the first place. All right. When we look at polarization, right? A polarization is... Um, when you still have electrons and, and, and protons, but the electrons sit on one side, all right? And you can polarize atoms that way. And it's still ultimately neutral, but it has a negative side and a positive side. All right, charged objects can attract a neutral insulator by inducing a charge, okay, which is the polarization in that neutral object. So you can have a neutral wall and you take your balloon and you rub your hair on it and remember your hair is going to give off all these electrons it'll hand it right to the balloon the balloons going around charged you get it close to your wall and it actually causes some polarization there um, same idea on a on a comb you can you can take a comb and you can polarize it all right so if you are bored or you want to hit pause it's kind of fun. Go get, you know, your great grandma's fur coat or whatever shawl you can find that's fur. Fur works really well for this. Works better than anything else. So if you can find a fur coat, it's more fun. Turn the water faucet on to a steady stream. Don't have it going real fast or anything, but just so it's a steady stream, not drop, 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 drop. Rub that comb all over grandma's fur coat and then hold it close to it and you can actually bend the water. Okay? Why can you bend the water? Let's think about the properties of water that you know I love. Next slide will help you with this. Remember water, it's a polar molecule. So the reason you can actually attract it to that comb is that it is neutral overall, but it is polarized. So you go rub your comb on grandma's fur coat, you get a bunch of electrons on it. Which side of this do you think you're attracting? Mickey Mouse's little ears is the right answer, the hydrogen part. All right, if we look at electric field lines, an electric field line goes, and, and this is just by definition, it indicates the direction a, a positive charge will feel in that field. So just by definition, we said, if we drop a positive charge in the middle of this field over here, all right? Which way is it going to go? Well, it's going to be repelled from here and it's going to go towards the negative. So by definition, we just always draw our arrows toward the negative and away from a positive because any place you drop a positive charge, it will go in that direction, right? You just got to standardize it and call it. That's the standard, so that's the way we do it. Okay, 
electric field lines. So when we draw them, again, we're going to draw the arrow, and you're going to draw it from the positive to the negative. Um, and here you can actually see pictures. Usually they just take iron, iron filings and drop it onto uh, charged rods here. And here you can take a look. Um, you tend to get this bending. This is your electric field here. If you have a rod, you tend to get the straight across part where it's the electric field going straight across. But if you look at the ends, same idea. It tends to bow out in a nice little field. All right. Electric potential energy. An electric potential energy is just like the potential energy when we talked about gravity. Remember Coulomb's law and how it was similar to the gravitational law? Well, this is a very similar idea. If you were to raise a block, um, the gravity would want to pull it down, you could release it, and you would have kinetic energy, right? You would just release it, and you would go from potential energy to kinetic energy. Well, we can do the exact same thing, but instead of having a gravitational force being the attractant here, we're having the electromagnetic force being the attracting force. So we have a positive, we have a negative, we know they attract each other by definition, and so this wants to move toward here. So potential energy, while it's not allowed to move, and as soon as it's allowed to move, it converts that to kinetic energy. So we really can think of this in some ways the way we think of gravity. Now, the analogy is going to fall apart at some point, but it does work to think about the energy created by these particles as they are held away from each other and then released. They will gain kinetic energy. Okay, so electric potential. Um, and again, if probably remember way back when when I scared you with the the sparkler and said wow it's you know it's got this crazy high temperature but it had no heat because there just wasn't a lot of it. Um, it just wasn't enough to burn you even though the temperature was really really hot well the same idea with volts we're always scared of volts oh volts high voltage you know you see these signs high voltage well, if there's not a lot of actual electrons there, even if the voltage is crazy high, it's actually perfectly safe. So your balloon might have 5,000 volts. It just doesn't have enough electrons to kill you. So go ahead and touch it. It's safe. No worries. Okay, a capacitor. Capacitors can be used to store separated positive and negative negative electrical charges. So what you can do is you can basically just take two plates and as long as they're insulated and away from each other, they're not touching. All right, so here we go. We have our positives and we have our negatives. We have a battery here and we are just storing them in this capacitor. Um, you can actually take these two plates and as long as you put an insulator between them, you can wrap them up and stick them into what's called a capacitor. Uh, capacitors were used in the first computers um, for the binary code, sort of that 1010. The capacitors were the first things ever used to do that. Just sort of a fun fact. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, if I can discharge a capacitor and turn on a light bulb, which you can, how is that different than a battery? Isn't that just what a battery is? And the answer is no, a battery will never kill you. A capacitor could. So they're not the same thing. Kind of have some similarities, but a battery is going to give you a constant voltage. It's going to just give off um, electrons at a very specific rate. The energy there is actually stored in chemical bonds. This is actually pure electrical storage, and it will just discharge the amount of um, electricity stored in there. So you end up um, sort of without the safety precautions, let's say, and it's a little bit different in how it works. So same idea in that it's storing electricity, but different on how it's going to be discharged.